on um, the parable of the ten virgins, but you know the the name parable of ten virgins, which we are accustomed to, does not quite um, you know explain what the parable is about. So. Um, to each one of these parables, I kind of try to put different names and name that I give to this one is building up reserves for tough times ahead, to build up reserves for tough times ahead. All right. And you know the story, you know the parable. Um, we read it at the beginning, uh, the parable of the virgins, 10 of them, five wise, five foolish, they are preparing for uh, uh, um, uh, the bridal party for the bridegroom to come, and um, he delays his coming. And as a result, uh, some of them were five of them were not um, prepared for the delay. They did not have the reserves built up in oil, and so they were shut out of the party. A sad story in many ways but it speaks strongly to every one of us. And so I want to speak um, on building up reserves for tough times ahead, because I believe that's what this parable is really focusing on. When I was young, <laughs> a favorite song um, for lovers and romantics was Jim Reeves's Distant Drums. Some of you will remember that song. In the opening stanza, he beseeches his girlfriend, Mary, to marry him because war was on the horizon and he feared he might be summoned to fight. If you remember the first line, some of you old timers, I hear the sound of distant drums far away, far away. And if they call for me to come, then I must go and you must stay. So Mary, marry me. Let's not wait. Let's share all the time we can before it's too late. Love me now, for now is all the time there may be. If you love me, Mary, Mary, marry me. For us, the drums of war are no longer beating. It is the first week of March 2022, and war is here. Russia has invaded Ukraine. And military and political analysts believe it is not just about land grabbing, but a move to rebuild the Soviet empire that collapsed in 1991. Experts expect that the Russian bear is going after her cubs that she lost in that breakup of the Soviet Union. For prophecy teachers, there is a justification for such a prognosis. They believe Russia is that king of the north spoken of by the prophets Daniel and Ezekiel, that prince of Rosh who will build an alliance with the nations that have grievances with the West due to their differing worldviews. This alliance will attack Israel, according to Ezekiel and Daniel, and set the stage for a blitzkrieg with the kings of the East, South, and West that will culminate in the Battle of Armageddon. Not surprisingly, many cynics say that preachers have been crying wolf for centuries, and this is just another false alarm. I would counter by saying the Russian move is not the only factor to raise such fears about an approaching Armageddon. But if many other prophecies coincide with the last days, events that were not present, or certainly not to the extent that we see today. For example, Daniel was told to shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end, when many will run to and fro and knowledge will increase, Daniel 12.4. With the internet, Google, and social media outlets, we have access to a world of knowledge at the touch of a keystroke. This glut of easily accessible information was not available to generations before ours. And with the recent coronavirus pandemic requiring everyone to be vaccinated and restrictions being put on those who refuse, it is easy to see how this is all a dry run for the mark of the beast without which no one will be able to buy or sell. In his Olivet Discourse, Jesus also alluded to the sea and the waves roaring. In these last days, 
An illusion, many believe, is to the disastrous effects of climate change on the planet. No generation before ours had discussions about climate change at the dinner table. And we can talk about many other signs that are exclusive to our day and which fit hand in glove with the, with the predictions for the end of days. This message, however, is not about prophecy. It's not about specific time, signs of the end time, but about cultivating an awareness of the times and storing up the reserves we need to see us through difficult days that are predicted to come before the return of the Lord. While that is the key lesson of the parable of these ten virgins, there is much more to the story, but it all re revolves around the setting up of reserves or the building up of reserves to cater for these unexpected um, contingencies, emergencies, these events that come upon us suddenly. Jesus, we know, loved the medium of storytelling to convey vital truth. His stories always employed imagery, customs, and manners that his hearers were well acquainted with, and so it was easy for them both to relate and to retain its lessons. In our parable today, he uses the common imagery of a wedding to speak to the people about preparedness for emergencies. In Jewish weddings, a groom would come with his parents and they would finalize the marriage. Then he would go back home and start working on his new house to get ready for his bride. When he's finished, he would return for his bride. But in the days when there were no cars and planes, telephones and telegram, internet and email, it was difficult to tell the exact time of the bridegroom's arrival. Hence, the bridal party had to ensure they are prepared for any undue delay in his arrival. In this case, there were 10 young women in the bridal party. They all had oil in their lamps. But a parable focuses on five of them who were deemed foolish. Why? Because the bridegroom was delayed and they did not cater for the delay. When he arrived at midnight, these five ran out of oil for their lamps and could not join the greeting party. Jesus said they were shut out from the wedding celebrations. The theme of this parable is clear. It is about having spiritual reserves to deal with life when things go out of normal. When things don't happen the way we anticipate, when expenses arise that we did not budget for, and when tragedies occur that we least expect. How will we react when abnormality strikes our faith? Will we have the extra oil in the tank to deal with it? These five foolish virgins were not unsaved people. They were in the company of the wise. They all had lamps. They all had oil. They all trimmed the wicks of their lamps and were all prepared for the arrival of the bridegroom. But the five foolish ones did not have the reserves to handle any deviation from set plans. The bridegroom was delayed and it caught them by surprise because they did not bring extra oil to cater for his delay. Spiritual reserves are necessary. We all need a backup plan for hard times and unanticipated problems. That is why we save, why we put aside a little of what we earn. It is a reserve for rainy days. I once worked for a company involved in the management of condominiums. One of the largest items, if not the largest item in a condominium budget, is the allocation of monies for reserve expenditures. This money is set aside 
based on a study done by professional engineers shortly after the building is completed to determine how much money the condominium would need for major repairs and replacements when the need arises. These funds are not safe expenditures in the current budget year, even though uh, the condominium owners pay a monthly installment towards it. They are set aside because they anticipate massive cash layouts in years ahead when the building structure or what is called the envelope or boilers or windows or roofing may need replacement. And so they have to cater for these. They have to set aside because they know these massive expenditures are going to come. And when the roof has to be replayed, replaced in 20 years time, if they don't set aside money for it, then the people who are living there will have to come up with millions of dollars to replace that roof. They anticipate this. And so they start setting aside a reserve. And so what happens if there's no reserve to meet the challenge? Residents will blame management and bail out of the condominium as fast as possible. Likewise, we need spiritual reserves because life does not always happen according to script. One of the same condominium company I worked with, the wife of a president, just 52 years old, otherwise healthy and bubbly, sat with me talking about workers' compensation, talking about provision. And then she said at two o'clock to me in the afternoon, she said, you know what? I need to just go for a quick day surgery. I'll be out at six and I'll come back tomorrow and we can resume this conversation. That happened to be the last conversation. She went into the hospital, never came out alive. And so among the first to be called to the hospital were my wife and, and, and myself. The president choking back tears said to us, we had a plan and this was not in it. This is not how it was supposed to happen. And then he said, for the first time in my life, I am afraid of the future. Just weeks before this tragedy, an acquaintance of ours had a sweet 16 birthday party for her daughter. At the end of the party, and after everyone had left and the host finished cleaning up, the father told the mother he wanted to speak to her about something important. He sat her down and began to tell her how he loves her and that she's a good mother and a good wife, but that he was no longer in love with her. He then picked up a suitcase that he had already packed overnight with his things and left the house never to return. From a Facebook post, she discovered that he had returned to his former wife. She collapsed into a hysterical heap of confusion, fear, and self-deprecation. That her father had passed away two weeks earlier only compounded her distress. This week, I, I like cricket, I watch cricket, and I'm reading this week of one Australian cricketer, um, who a wicket keeper, who died in his early 70s, and the world was shocked because he was a healthy, um, otherwise healthy person, busy doing commentary and all kinds of different things, and he passed away. As we are reading the news, as I'm reading the news, two days later, they're still talking about, you know, all the um, eulogies and, 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 and the well wishes are still coming out for him. Another cricketer, world famous, died at 52 years of age of a heart attack. They one of the greatest leg spinners, if not the greatest leg spinners in, in the history of cricket died and Australia is in shock right now as to how this happened, 52 years of age. The truth is that many of us live the normal Christian life so long as the Christian life is normal. I like that, so I'm gonna say it again. Many of us live the normal Christian life so long as the Christian life is normal. But what happens when two police officers turn up at your door with the news that your son was involved in a fatal crash? How will you react when your spouse or lover tells you they don't want to be with you anymore? What will you do if you were to turn up to work next week and are handed a pink slip? And this brings us to the crux of this parable. And that is storing up reserves for the unexpected. How can we ensure that we have enough reserves 
to see us through those unexpected bills, that unexpected accident, that unexpected job loss, or the loss of a partner. What can we do to ensure we do not collapse in a heap of despair, depression, or even suicide when life takes us on a detour? We hedge our investments so that our portfolios can withstand fluctuations in the market. But how can we hedge ourselves against the vagaries of life and the unexpected delays in the fulfillment of promises? Looking into the eyes of his followers, Jesus asked a disturbing question. He asked, when the Son of Man returns to earth, will he find faith? How can we maintain faith until Christ, our bridegroom, returns for us? The Bible makes it clear that the world is not going to get better, which means it's going to deteriorate morally, spiritually, ecologically, politically, and that people's hearts will fail them for fear so that the love of many Christians will wax cold. And in this deteriorating environment where hostility to Christians will reach its zenith and where there will be a great apostasy or falling away, the question as to how we will maintain persevering faith to wait for our bridegroom becomes relevant. I said the major lesson of this parable is about establishing reserves for the unexpected events of life. And so with this parable as a backdrop, I wish to suggest a few ways in which we can build up those reserves. First, stock up on good company. Stock up on good company. The girls in a bridal party often agree on the same style of, wedding, of, of dress, the same style of shoes, hairdos, and would even have the same person to do their makeups. So how is it that half of this bridal party was prepared for the occasion and the other half was not? How is it that five of these girls thought it prudent to take extra oil with them and the others did not? I highly doubt that they were excluded from the discussions. I am more apt to believe that they did not want the advice of the wiser girls. The fact that five of them were wise implies that those girls were more experienced, more mature, and that they had experience with weddings and the dangers and delays inherent in those Middle Eastern bridal caravans having to make their way to their destination. But in this group of women, we see the division that is common in the Christian faith community. Some are carnal and some are spiritual. The five foolish girls represent Christians with just enough oil to make a fair show in the flesh. They have no principle within. They have a lamp of profession in their hands, but do not have in their hearts that stock of sound knowledge, rooted dispositions, and settled resolutions which are necessary to carry them through the services and trials of the present state. They act on the inf under the influence of external inducements, but are void of spiritual life. In the parable of the sower, Jesus tells us that some seeds fell on good ground and some on stony ground. If we were to divide this group of 10 women into two, we would say the, the word of God fell on the, on the five foolish uh, good virgins, there were good ground, and the foolish virgins were stony ground. These girls had fancy lamps for a show, but no oil within. They are like that tree that Jesus cursed, that fig tree. It was full of foliage, full of leaves, the Bible says. But when Jesus searched the tree, he could not find a single fruit. The sad truth is that birds of a feather do flock together. And for this reason, smart people like to hang with smart people. And sadly, the opposite is also true. 
just as the spiritual person seeks out those who are of like mind, the carnal person also seeks out those who can justify their type of fleshly indulgence and superficial religion. Think about church. Think about churches. And why churches split and why churches break up. It is not that when somebody is being told something, they say, you know what, I need to seek counsel of the spiritual people in this church. And when people want to do bad stuff, they have a tendency to search out the people in the church who think like them. Who will share their, their, their thoughts and their minds and agree with them. Misery is a terrible thing because it loves company. If we are going to make it through the midnight of life's challenges, we need to develop good relationships. And by good, I mean godly relationships, relationships with righteous people. The Bible says to forsake not the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some is. So much more as you see that they approach it, approaching. What day? He's referring to the return of the bridegroom, the second coming of Jesus. These foolish girls broke ranks with the wise girls. They traded prudence and wisdom for blind faith. We don't need to be as fanatical as them, they might have said. They are overzealous, holy rollers. They are going too far, storing up extra oil. These are the Christians who go to church on Wednesdays and Sunday mornings and Sunday school and pray meetings and everything else. We don't need all of that. Sunday morning is good enough for us. We don't need all those reserves. They are the people who had called to prayer, say we don't need to harp in God's ears day and night. God knows. Occasional prayer is sufficient. These are the Christians who go to church when the need arises and who pray when trouble comes and who ask, why do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? The five wise girls were tuned into the realities of life. They were aware that sometimes circumstances beyond our control occur. And sometimes things do not go according to plan, despite utmost care and diligence in planning. In other words, the wise prepare for contingencies. Who are you hanging with? Who are you taking advice from? Can the company you keep help you when life throws you a curveball? Or will they disappear from you when destitution strikes like they did to the prodigal son? Can the celebrities you follow and whom you know more about than you do the Bible, will they come to your rescue when adversity comes your way? David said, I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord. He wanted to be in the company of the righteous because he saw them as people who lifted, encouraged, and strengthened him for life's challenges. The president of the condominium management company I mentioned called on my wife and me when he received news that it, his wife had lost brain function. He called on us in the middle of the night. It was past midnight for that matter. Who will be there for you to call on when tragedy strikes close to home? Build a reserve of godly friends. Stick to the company of the righteous. Every now and again, I ask the question, not out of, not out of spite or anything, but I ask out of real concern, where are the people who left our church? Where are the people who were seduced by others to leaving the company of the righteous? Who were lured out by the devil? What happened to them? Where are they? What are they doing? And most of the reports I get is that they're knocking around from here to there like wandering stars. They can't find a place of settlement. I thank God for those of you who remain. It's not about me. 
It is about a commitment to Jesus Christ and to believe that God puts us all in a place that he wants us to be and that wherever we are, we can make a difference. It is about a relationship with God, not the relationship with another brother or the pastor or the board. It is about maintaining a relationship with Jesus Christ and trusting God to use us where he plants us. Stock up on good friends. Two, stock up on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Scripture often uses oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The call to be filled with the Spirit is thus a summons to stock up on extra anointing. This is reserved anointing for the extraordinary events and unexpected crises of life. From this parable, we could say that the 10 young women in the bridal party, five of them, of these 10, five were filled with the spirit and five had just barely enough anointing to last them for a few hours. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is like gas in a car. As the car drives, it consumes gas and must be refilled. If you have a half a tank of gas, you can travel half the distance as if compared to if you have a full tank of gas. And that is a simple analogy, perhaps too simple, but I think it makes the point when it comes to talking about reserve oil. On most days, a half-filled tank may work for us, but what happens when you're down to the bottom of the tank and you miss the next gas station on the highway? What happens when the tank is at rock bottom and you're called for an emergency in the middle of the night? Will you have time to find a gas station when those extra minutes could result in the death of someone who just had a heart attack? Many Christians wait until their spiritual tank is dry before they come to the Lord for a refill. Unfortunately, many of them, like those five girls, are taken unawares and are out of time to refuel their tanks. The bridegroom was delayed so that he arrived at midnight. Where were they going to find oil at midnight? This is the Middle Eastern days and the days of Jesus. Once it gets dark, everything shuts down. Imagine the panic as they ran through the streets, calling out to shop owners and being turned away. Think of the embarrassment when they finally returned to the banquet hall to find that the door was shut. And they, Half of the bridal party were locked out. Storing up reserves is all about living on the principle that prevention is better than cure. Just as it is easier on the mind and psychologically easier on the pocketbook to keep your gas topped up at all times, so too when we are full of the Holy Spirit, we do not have to worry about emergencies. We will be ready. The successful Christian is life lived in prevention mode. Those who are filled with the spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh and they will never be under condemnation. So seize every opportunity for prayer. It is better to top up your spiritual tank every day than having to fill the whole tank at once when trouble comes. Just as how we fill up our car when there's still gas in it and not when it runs empty because then we cannot get the car to the station. Many saints have neglected the place of prayer and are running on fumes. When they turn up to a prayer meeting, you wonder, oh, oh what's the problem now? They are so spiritually malnourished, they do not even have the strength to pray. Some believers are so dry that rust has taken over their spiritual tanks. I've seen many saints neglect the house of prayer. And when they do stumble in, they cannot pray because they're so overwhelmed by troubles. They do not know where to begin. Don't allow your tank to run on empty. I try to keep my gas tank relatively full, and it has become a habit now. When I get home and park the truck, my eyes always light on the gas gauge. I'm always thinking, do I have enough gas in case an emergency strikes at night and I have to rush someone to the hospital? 
I try to do the same with my spiritual tank. Do I have enough reserves to handle any bad news or emergency? I remember some years ago, a group of us, mostly young people, we were called, asked to exercise a demon from a young man. <laughs> and instead of going, we all said from one side, um, can we meet in another hour or two? Why? We all scrambled home to get our hearts right. <laughs> we repented of all the wrongs we ever did, prayed for forgiveness, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and for protection from the demon, so that should he leave, he will not enter one of us. <laughs> none of us, none of us were prepared. We should always be in that state of spiritual readiness, so that if anyone needs us, be it at a bus stop, at work, in the supermarket, or church, and ask us to pray for them, we will be ready. That is what it means to have reserve oil. Third, stock up on the word of God. The word of God is our roadmap. It is a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our paths. When life pushes us on a detour, it becomes our GPS to reroute us to safety. I'm sure that the wise girls saw the other five without extra oil and might have asked them if they did not think it wise to go and get some more oil before the shops closed up for the night. Anything can happen. And the things we most often fear have a nasty way of coming to pass. That's what Job found. And that's what many of us experience. Perhaps these were wise girls had a word of wisdom concerning the delay and shared it with the others. But the foolish ones must have dismissed the wise ones as another bunch of doom and gloom preachers. The psalmist saw the need for reserves. He said, your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does he mean by hiding the word? He means storing up the word. And why did he find it prudent to store up the word? Because he knew that one day life will come at him without warning. And if he does not have God's word to guide and to control his responses, he might make decisions that he would later regret. Storing up the word. Think back to the duel between Jesus and Satan in the wilderness. What would have happened to Jesus, and by extension the world, if he did not have the word of God in his heart when Satan threw those darts at him in the wilderness? He rebuffed all three of Satan's suggestions with the word. And as we wait for the bridegroom to return, we will have to deal with conflicts and trials and temptations. And it's only the word of God that will preserve us until that day. If we are stocked up on the word of God, unplanned diversions will not cause us to panic and make decisions we will regret later. The word of God will keep us in check. Like a set of traffic lights, it will tell us when we should go, when to stop, and when to proceed with caution. Let me conclude. The bridegroom is coming back. It's coming back. That's the hope, the blessed hope of the church, that our Lord is coming back for us. Yes, he's delayed, but for a reason. One of which is to give sinners a chance to repent. The Bible says God is not willing to, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that he's a long suffering. He's delayed his return to give sinners a chance to repent. But the foolish don't think so. They say the Lord has been coming for generations, for centuries, and still he's not here. That it's all a farce made up by the church for their self-serving purposes. 
Let me say it, that the return of the Lord is not a doctrine created by the church. It is Jesus' teaching. And the wise will not allow father time or the pleasures of sin or impatience or bad company to make us lose focus. My eyes are on the eastern skies and my heart is in tune with heaven's pulse because I pray, I study the word of God, and I stay in the company of good people. I know my faith will face challenges. I've read the book of Revelation and all the end time prophecies, and so I'm not living in a cocoon. I choose rather to stock up on the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, and on good company. I remember when we were on the cusp of Y2K, how everyone was stocking up on groceries for fear that the power grids will fail. The supermarkets, the supermarkets were empty. The shelves were all empty. People were stocking up on water, oil, and lamps, and food, as if Armageddon was at the door. Well, more than ever, with the king of the north on the move, Armageddon seems to be drawing closer, which means the Lord's coming is imminent. It is at hand. It can happen at any time. And Jesus foretold that before his return, the world will experience perilous times. His, his followers will find their love for him growing cold from waiting, from the distractions of life, and from being consumed with carnal pleasures. But those who are wise will endure persecution. They will withstand trials and temptations. They will discern and avoid satanic diversions. They will refuse to bow their knees to Baal, even at the threat of death. So let us stock up on oil, the anointing, with water, the word, and keep ourselves in the company of the righteous fellowship. If we do these things, we will not be ashamed at his coming, and we will enter with him to the great marriage supper of the Lamb. May God bless.